All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, we are back in open session. So we will start off. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, meeting of July 27th. Um, didn't have a chance, but a reminder that if you want to, uh, you know, speak, please fill out a speaker's card, and then I'll, we'll have that out of the way. And uh, we will start. Should we go ahead, and st go ahead and start? I think we're a little bit early, but we're, we better li listen to the folks about back. I'm sorry. Are we, are we on the air yet or not? Or we need to wait. I will find out. Like you're five minutes earlier. Yeah, we are a little early here, which is odd for us. <laughs> <laughs> We're good? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we, we will open up with an invocation from Tim Boone of uh, Bridge House Ministry, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance uh, by uh, Joe Cronin. Please stand. Lord, we want to thank you for America. We want to thank you for the ability to live in a democracy. Your word says that we should respect those in authority and with the difficulties facing our country right now because of COVID, because of tensions being high on many different fronts. At this time, more than ever, we pray for wisdom and the ability to guide and to lead by our leaders at the state, at the federal, and at the local level. Thank you for their leadership and give them wisdom and discernment and lead them to make the decisions that are right, that are pure, and that are true. We know that throughout time, you have led us through difficult situations and difficult times. And we have the complete confidence in you that you will lead us, especially those in leadership, through this difficult time. Again, we thank you and we praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You roll call or not? Sure. Okay. Councilmember Cronin? Here. Councilmember Brazel? Here. Councilmember Elam? Councilmember Hammond? Here. Councilmember Hollander? Here. Councilmember Schneider? Here. Councilmember White? Here. Uh, first on the agenda is uh, public comments. I just want to remind uh, you folks a couple of things. Uh, number one is to fill out a speaker card, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, also, we will limit the uh, uh, topic uh, three, four, and three against on, on any particular topic, okay? Um, and we'll start off with uh, Claire. Bill number 4864, Nancy Abersturi. I live at 898 Forest Road, <clears throat> and I'm here to speak as I am opposed to the rezoning and development. We've been through this just months ago. We came, we spoke, we brought petition signatures from residents in the area, 87 of them. At that meeting, Mr. Brazel told the developer that this was something that the residents clearly did not want and suggested that the developer come back to council with a plan for five plus acre homes. The developer chose instead to ch table the motion, but now he's back. Still, I hear no reasons how three acre homes are gonna be of benefit to current residents. I've heard the term berm bandied about by the engineer. When I spoke with folks in the Autumn Meadow area and mentioned the developer's promise to build berms, one resident replied, a lot of good berms dead us. We have water in our basement. We bought property here because five acres plus was required and many of the area, area residents told me the same reason for them living here. It's a significant to note that in the past several weeks we received amazing support from residents living within 1,000 feet of the property under discussion tonight. In fact, we also received a huge so, show of support of residents living within 2,000 feet of the proposed rezoning. Folks out here in our area don't want three acre subdivisions. At the July 13th County Council meeting, Mr. Brazel mentioned that recent new land owners in the Forest Hill Road, Morrison Road area are building new homes in respect of the five plus acre rule and asked how it was fair to make an exception to the rule for this development, how, this developer, how is that fair? It makes sense to me, 
that he should have to play by the same rules that everyone else. As Mr. Brazel said at the, time, at the time, this is about greed. I was under the impression that current residents and their concerns came first. He doesn't live here and has no vested interest in our community. He won't be around when septic systems fail on three acres, as they are more likely to do. He won't be here when berms flood basements, when bicyclists and runners, horseback riders, and more danger on our roadways. He won't be here when increased traffic creates more noise, pollution, and trash, when schools that are already over capacity are further cramped, when washed out roads between farmers' fields are worse than they already are, and when more cars are going off the road into our yards, and when destruction of wooded areas leave wildlife nowhere to go but in residents' yards, creating potentially unsafe encounters with humans. If you grant this exception, there will be no end to it. It will open the floodgates for more developers to expect the same exception. We live in a lovely, safe, rural, historic community. Please help us keep it that way by denying this rezoning and development petition. Thanks. Thank you, Tom O'Toole. Members of the council, Mr. Chairman, Judge, Thank you for the time. Again, uh, on this application, since the limited time, let me make a couple of observations. This has been an interesting process because we've been to planning and zoning twice. Once the preliminary plan was denied because of stormwater issues, back to planning and zoning again. Both times the plan planning and zoning commission approved this rezoning or recommended it to this council. The planning department staff in both instances has recommended approval of this rezoning. And when this matter came before this council, the planning department again recommended approval. Mr. Griffey has complied with every request the county has asked in this regard. In addition, as we made the point last time we were here, that this request is absolutely in compliance with Envision 2030, which is the county's comprehensive plan. This council several months ago, earlier this year, approved a, the Miners Hagen development. Similar property, about the same size tract, about the same number of homes. I heard last time when we were here that there was some suggestion that that occurred because of its proximity to Wentzville and maybe the possibility of some potential annexation. So let's get this property rezoned. The subject property is closer to New Melly than the Miners Hagen tract was to Wentzville. In my 30 plus years of doing this, I frankly have never seen a property that was more ripe for rezoning than the Griffey and Greystone Holdings request. Now let me say something about Mr. Griffey. 35 years of being in the development business in this county, enjoys a fabulous reputation. I think it was even acclaimed last time we were at council. My experience in representing developers, they know more about the valuation of real estate in their regions than real estate appraisers, than city councils, county councils, than lawyers, because they have to sell the product. Mr. Griffey sent many of you a, a, an email asking you to consider this request. And in that email, he made the distinction that the five-acre lots under the current zoning agricultural is just not marketable in this time. People are not looking for five acre tracks. And I want to show you, if I can, the property that's situated. I don't know if that. It'll come up. It, it, it'll come. The property, the Auburn Meadows tract that's situated next to the subject. Uh, last time we saw streetscapes of Forest Hill Road that looked like all farming property. This property is situated. Here's the subject property. Here's the Auburn Meadows tract. It's, it encompasses the property. Uh, I think also Mr. Uh, Griffey's point about the time that we're experiencing COVID and putting people to work in this development. And uh, we're here to glad to answer any questions the council may have later, but we'd humbly ask you to reconsider this request when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Claire? Sabrina Wren.
I just recovered crawling up the stairs with a mask on, so I'm breathing kind of heavily. Um, with regard to the suggestion that um, this property is going to be annexed by New Mallee because the Miners Hagen property was potentially annexable by um, Wentzville, I want to indicate that this is. It'll come out in a second. Yeah, thank you. This is the Wentzville City Hall. This is the New Melly City Hall. <laughs> this is the Wentzville Business District. This is the New Melly Business District. I doubt very seriously that we are under a threat of annexation. I would also tell you that the chances of us getting public sewers out where we live are not very good. Um, the fact that we might could, could have developers demanding four houses on one acre, these are all, in my humble opinion, boogeyman arguments and uh, don't have much traction to them. Um, the truth is that every house that we put on the land out where we live adds a burden, and it adds a burden both for the property, neighboring properties and for the county because there's an expectation that you all will provide <coughs> services that are needed out there. In 2004, when they were doing the Auburn Meadow development, the same engineering group represented to the residents out there as follows. The Bax engineering firm designing the Auburn Meadow subdivision, this is a quote from the Boone County Connection, assured residents and the council that every precaution was being taken to make sure runoff would not harm surrounding properties. <clears throat> They also suggested that residential usage with the planting of grass would create less runoff than planted fields. They also stated that only the grading to be done would be to create roads, which wouldn't destroy a large number of terraces on the land. And finally, it was mentioned that they would install a culvert al allowing for driveway entrances. We know now, 18 years later, 16 years later, that that's not what happened. We know now. There's no, there's no dispute about this because the engineering group has admitted it that Mrs. Molitor's farm has been run over with water. Auburn Meadow residents have been concerned and demonstrated that they too have experienced very serious water problems. So these representations about what they can do to prevent water problems are simply not true. As with regard to the septic systems, the master plan specifically says that they are a problem and that they should be discouraged and avoided. Planning and zoning shouldn't be admitting to that kind of a problem in their master plan and at the same time, out of the other side of the mouth, saying to put septic systems in heavier than we should. I have a lot more to say on this topic, but my three minutes are up. Thank you. Claire. And on the COVID response, Anina Keener. Good evening. Two weeks ago, I came here uh, to speak about the mask mandate. That didn't happen. While we were here, we watched this county council, the county executive, fawn all over Bob Onder and Bill Igle. It was disgraceful. You, t you told us that they would bring information from the state. Neither of them made any comments about what the state was doing. Bob Onder, however, commented about the science in air quotes. Bill and Bob are regular citizens just like everyone else in this room, and you gave them unlimited time to, to campaign. Now let's talk about schools. In the county's own graphic, you state that safe things to do are online classes, outdoor walks or hikes, something you might use caution with, grocery stores, extended shopping, takeout food. Do you know what the county encourages us to avoid? Weddings. Every lunch shift, every day, almost every student is in there and it's equivalent to a wedding. When you are in the classroom, the amount of people is like a group hangout 
or a house party, also in the red zone. Just another fact, Dr. Anders' office requires masks and restricts the amount of people in the waiting room and the amount of people that go back to the exam room. But let's send our, all our kids back to school where we will have no ability to socially distance. This is irresponsible and directly opposes what the doctor is doing in his office. Friday, the Surgeon General noted that communities with positive rates of 10% or less uh, could move toward an in-person in move toward in-person classes. Here are the statistics for St. Charles County. As of Saturday, July 26, the average number of new cases per day is 25.69 per 100,000 people. The CDC criteria is either two weeks of decreasing cases or below five per week per 100,000 people to start school. St. Charles County is over five times that value. When the 86th death was reported on July 23rd, the mortality rate among all confirmed cases was 3.1%. But today, we listed four more deaths. 11.64% of all cases in St. Charles County are people under the age of 20. The assumption that children don't contact, contract this virus is not supported by the data. Yeah. Students, teachers, support staff are all vulnerable, not to mention in-person school will increase the spread of this virus. Ma'am, your three minutes is up. Yeah. I, we appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that you do. Yes, we do. <laughs> it's time for all of us, to, for all of you to step up and lead. We need masks, we need a mask mandate, we need restrictions on bars and schools, and schools should be virtual. You know, I've, I've looked at mask mandates and I've talked to, to county staff about comparing what St. Saint, Saint Louis's county of sp spread is with the new mask mandate versus against it. But to go back to your comments, the decision whether to have it in schools, I think should be made by the schools. School boards have an elected, let me finish please, I listen to you. Schools, schools have an elected body, okay? They have, a, they have a health official. So if you really want to mandate masks or do whatever you do at schools, you need to be talking to school board, not your county council. Really? Yes. Your county should do it. The well, school boards are in. Are out on their own. Schools okay. have their own separate right. political jurisdictions. Claire, let's go to the next speaker. Richard Orr. By the way, the school districts are mandating masks. My daughter's a teacher in the city of St. Charles School District. Uh, parents have the right to choose either virtual learning or in-person learning. You know who doesn't have the right? I'm sorry? Do you know who doesn't have the right to choose? Yeah, their parents do. Their no, parents the choose. Teacher. Well, teachers don't have the right Teachers to can do virtual teaching if they like. No, uh, no they don't. Oh. No. Masks are required in school as well. Not, not third grade enough. Third grade this is a school board okay. issue. Mr. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Quiet. Quiet. That's it. Follow the county. Everybody settle down here. Mr. Mr. Ma'am. 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 Mr. Orr, you're, you, you have the floor. Well, thank you. We've got Richard Orr from. Uh, Woodsview Drive in Harvester. I just have a little statement I would like to read on this mask issue. I want to add that it's very encouraging to see so many masks here today. So as County Executive Elman has pointed out recently, COVID infections are up dramatically in the county, mainly among those 20 to 40 years of age, probably due to clustering together at parties, restaurants, and bars. The St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force now calls St. Charles County the top hotspot for COVID-19 in the St. Louis area. St. Louis County, which is also experiencing an upswing in new cases, announced additional new restrictions on bars, businesses, and crowds today on top of its existing requirement that everyone wear a mask. Missouri is up to about 44,000 cases now with over 1,000 new ones yesterday alone. 
The St. Charles County has the fourth highest number of cases in the state among large cities and other counties with a total of about 3,200. That's not a comfortable ranking in my opinion. St. Louis County and St. Louis City have issued public health orders requiring all individuals to wear a face mask or covering at all times when, indoor when in indoor facilities and outside when social distancing is not possible. The requirement applies to everyone over the age of nine with some medical exceptions. According to the CDC, public health and officials with St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force, COVID-19 spreads mainly through aerosols and droplets among people who are in close contact with one another about six feet. The use of face mask coverings is scientifically proven safe and simple, a scientifically proven safe and simple way to decrease the risk of transmitting coronavirus. The voluntary mask initiative, Mask Up St. Charles, is a good start, but mask wearing must be made mandatory. When you enter an establishment that requires masks, currently such as Walmart, Schnucks, or Menards, the shoppers there are very happy and feel secure and safer than they do when in establishments that don't care and are filled with maskless patrons. Even the nearby conservative state of Indiana that, like us, opened too early now requires mask wearing under the pain of law. So let's get serious and start mandating mask wearing. Thank you. Luke Gekoff. In a room of 25 people in St. Charles County right now, there's a 57% chance that at least one person is COVID-19 positive. Based on a county risk assessment tool by researchers at Georgia Tech, this number jumps to 81% for gatherings of 50 people and near statistical certainty beyond 100. This is St. Charles data, not St. Louis city or county, which the members of this council are quick to prove were nothing like. With respect to your comments about masks, you do not have this under control. Aggressive mitigation should continue by nearly every salient metric. 9.14% positive test rate in the past week, a countywide need for upwards of 294 contact tracers, and a staggering weekly moving average of 25.7 new cases per 100,000 that outpaces Missouri and the nation. Here is the recent exponential increase in new cases per 100,000 in St. Charles in green, and Missouri and the United States in red and blue, respectively. The horizontal purple line represents the CDC's low incidence threshold. Communities should move forward from one phase of mitigation to another if new cases decrease for two weeks or fall below this line. Despite the insistence of scientifically illiterate officials and masses, increased testing fails to account for this surge. I'm deeply troubled by your parroting of discussion points rooted in partisan grandstanding rather than science. One would be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't share the goal of business as usual, getting a coffee with a friend, catching a Cardinals game, or sending kids off to school on the bus. But we don't get there by clinging to the comforting premise that new cases will not yield more deaths, or that physically distancing and wearing masks is somehow a violation of individual liberties. The true liberty in play is everyone's right to be free from disease. I do not grant you or anyone the right to knowingly and recklessly risk further infection with such callous disregard for human life. Your liberty to swing your fists ends where my nose begins. I implore you to evolve your position on testing, contact tracing, and mandating masks. We must also commit to combating the racism inherent in our institutions that seek to invent pseudoscientific, biological, behavioral, and geographic causes for the health inequities faced by black and Latinx people in our communities, including those espoused by Senator Igel on the floor earlier this month. COVID-19 does not discriminate. If we are complicit in the racial injustice surrounding this pandemic, we reveal a complete lack of the critical mental faculty of discrimination. With regard to schools, measures of community transmission must drive the decision to reopen. Let us be clear, this is not the fault of teachers who triaged an educational crisis and asked now not to be sacrificed at the altar of capitalism in return. Pressingly, students cannot learn if they are sick. Teachers cannot teach if they're hospitalized or dead. I submit to the council my research and relevant data supporting my conclusions. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Claire? Susan Niederberger. Good evening. My name is Susan Niederberger. I am a fourth generation resident of St. Charles County. I was the third generation in my family to attend St. Charles High School. I attended grade school down the street at the Academy of the Sacred Heart. My maternal grandmother was the finance director for the city of St. Charles. My paternal grandmother was a surgical nurse around the corner at St. Joe's. My mother taught for 30 years in the city of St. Charles School District. This town, this region, is part of my family. It is part of who I am. I am a middle school teacher in the county. I am at an age when I teach the children of folks with whom I went to high school or college. As a teacher, I know we cannot safely reopen our buildings right now. My friends who have school-aged children have been reaching out to me and the other teachers they know because their questions keep going unanswered by their school districts. School districts that insist on reopening buildings have plans in which social distancing will take place when possible. It is not possible. It is not possible to reopen school buildings under near normal circumstances and avoid a pandemic hitting our schools. I have two comorbidities and I'm scared to death. Some teachers and school district employees feel that everything is fine. The majority though are like me. We feel we will be entering the slaughterhouse instead of the schoolhouse this fall. We have taken action. We have contacted our local school boards more than once. We have contacted our district administration more than once. They are not listening to us. I am here tonight with my colleagues asking that you step in and provide leadership to our skill, to our, that our school districts will not. I realize there is pressure to reopen buildings due to child supervision concerns. Those concerns can be addressed without reopening building, buildings to hundreds and hundreds of students, putting the lives of students and staff members on the line. Our school districts do not have to reopen school buildings to allow the economy to recover. Our school districts do not have to reopen school buildings to ensure that students will continue to receive an education. These are unprecedented times. Did Londoners insist on opening their schools during the Blitz? It is not safe to reopen schools right now. Those of us who are advocating for 100% virtual learning are not asking for this to be permanent. We realize there are drawbacks to virtual learning, but the drawback to reopening school buildings is that people will get sick, some of whom may die. How many of my colleagues will get sick? How many of my students will get sick? How will my students or I be able to focus while we're in a building that normally houses 900 people, some of whom have been diagnosed with COVID? One final question. Have you been able to understand everything I've said with this mask on? Now imagine you are a child and this is how you spend your day at school. Our school districts must not reopen school buildings if they want to prevent the loss of human lives. Thank you, Arnie Dinoff. Thank you. Mr. Dinoff. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the County Council. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff. I'm a public advocate resident running for Missouri Lieutenant Governor August 4th. And um, the first thing I'd like to lead out by is school teacher association presidents of the large five school districts of St. Charles County would like to meet with County Executive Steve Ellman, Joanne Lycom, Director of Administration, and Public Health Director Chapman. They've reached out. No meeting has been established as of since. Mr. Ellman, I pray that we can make this meeting happen for the over 10,000 certified teachers in St. Charles County. They have issues. They have issues to discuss with you and Mr. Chapman and Ms. Lycom. And you need to have an open ear because all 430,000 residents matter here. 10 days ago, I reached out to your assistant director of administration, and I will continue to work with Mr. John Greifshu to try to establish a meeting. School is coming up in less than a month, and they want to meet with you because they have concerns. Please have a heart and open up your doors to your office. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is bill number 4864. We've been down this road over and over and over since last January, members of the council. Deny the vote. 
once and for all. This is not the direction of zoning and quality of life that St. Charles County residents want. We want to rezone our county uh, uh, d desires and wants. This is hogwash, political, and follow the money. Follow the money on the Missouri Ethics Commission in terms of campaign contributions. Our county is not about profit for the attorney who represented the applicant down on Forest Hill Road, but it's about, it's about the best quality of life for our, 400, for our 430 county residents. Now looking on your agenda on the uh, airport manager's report in terms of a grant in the amount of $69,000, and you want to tap the CARES Act. Again, this is unbelievable that you want to tap the CARES Act, and I quote, to establish a parking lot pavement repairs, to establish vehicle acquisition reimbursement, and for utility cost reimbursement. I'm gonna have a problem with the U.S. Attorney uh, General's Office and also the Adjutant General that does the accounting for the federal government because this doesn't qualify under the CARES Act. I don't know what attorneys over to the right are authorizing this or giving you this type of information, but this is the wrong use of the CARES Act. Now, you want another CARES Act uh, for $58,008 ,008 for the police department? I, I see where that could be. And then we have the Francis Howell School District. I'm asking for a fair cost share program. And Chief Fritz, you know, I like you and I support you 100%, Chief. But can we have more details in these memos? There's lots of questions to be asked here. The, we need a fair share between the school district and the county of St. Charles. And I think that needs to be ironed out before you approve this bid package with the Francis House School District. Okay. Thank you very much, members. Thank you, Mr. Enough. No <laughs> okay, uh, th there are no more uh, uh, public comments. Uh, the next on the agenda is the oral report from the county executive. This young lady right here that saw her fall apart, she did submit it to the clerk. You, you allowed for yeah, four? We, yeah, we normally allow three, four, three against, and we did allow four, actually, so. Uh, that first was come, following first. the rules. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, that's. Uh, <laughs> no, we, okay. Can we have? Ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry. Ma'am. Ma'am, first first of all, okay, we we've we followed our own rules. We've we've allowed four speakers on this subject. Actually, we normally would just allow three, and I understand that probably everyone here that that came for this topic would like to speak. Okay, but I, I really believe that we have to follow the the agenda that we've laid out, and, and we certainly appreciate your opinions, and we've listened, you know, closely to what you have to say. So. I see no motion. Mr. Chairman. County Executive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to go over the uh, presentation I made two weeks ago and basically update it. Uh, this is the uh, uh, positive confirmed cases. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it has continued to go up. Uh, some signs it may be, uh, it may be flattening out, but I, I, I don't think, I think it's too soon to uh, to uh, assume that, and we'll need to wait. Ma'am, I believe you are teachers. Uh, I spent 34 years teaching, all right? So I understand when people are feel strongly about something, but we have to kind of, we need to withhold our emotions and have respect for the people that are presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, um, you know, we, we, we can hope that it's flattening the curve, but it's way too soon to, uh, to assume that. So uh, this still is a very, very, very concerning. Uh, this is the uh, cases uh, by age group. Uh, as we saw two weeks ago, the 20 to 30-year uh, age group is just out of control. The big change uh, is there has been a significant increase in the in the 10 to 20, in the 10 to 20 year old age group, and uh, I think uh, we've heard stories about uh, about school proms and 
graduations. And uh, again, as a former teacher, and I'm a former teacher, and all the former teachers here and present teachers here know that uh, that it's one thing to have a graduation or even a prom. The problem is what happens before and after and all the partying. So hopefully, uh, with what's happened in the western part of the county, uh, parents are uh, are are talking to their uh, uh, their high school age students about uh, social distancing and wearing masks and so forth. Uh, again, um, this this was good uh, good news in the sense that yes, we are growing. We're growing about the same as uh, same rate as St. Louis County right now. Um, the good news, but is of course we started off at a much lower level. So while we're growing at the same rate, we still have half the number of cases uh, per ten thousand. Uh, this is uh, people continue to. Um, uh, continue to basically go out. This is again the graph that shows the number of people uh, using the roads and you can see that it was uh, down by 50 percent back in April. It's back to maybe 90 percent of what it was when when all of this started. Uh, again, uh, the good news in the first uh, 90 days of the um, in the first 90 days of the pandemic, we were averaging 24 deaths uh, per month. Uh, in the last uh, 30 days, we've had 13. And someone did point out we had four uh, deaths over the weekend. Uh, one person in his 60s, the other two were in their 80s and in nursing homes, uh, which pretty much continues that trend. You see at the bottom there, 84% uh, of the deaths are people in, uh, in nursing homes. Um, so, again, uh, back in April, you can see the, the peak on hospital admissions, and that's when uh, a lot of the stay-at-home orders were issued and so forth. Uh, we were about half of that two weeks ago, and then it went up last week, and it's back down this week. Uh, again, um, too, uh, too soon to draw any conclusions and, and to really call it great news, but uh, at least the trend right now is in the right direction when it comes to hospitalizations. Uh, confirmed cases, again, you can see the last 14 days, it has, uh, it has doubled, 115% uh, higher. Uh, as you can see from the previous slide, a lot of those are in the 20 to 40 uh, uh, age uh, group. Total quarantine persons, um, 12, 11, and again, the quarantines, like the mask, uh, the mask effort, is only going to be uh, effective if people believe it's important to do that. And in the past, we have had very good response uh, from people who've been uh, told to quarantine. Others have been asked to quarantine. Uh, we're, uh, we're, people aren't quite as cooperative now as they were a month ago. Uh, but still, uh, they are because people understand once you're once you have the disease, you definitely can uh, pass it on to someone else. And uh, as long as we continue to do a, a good job on 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 quarantine, um, I think that's the the most important thing we can do. Uh, these are the numbers uh, again on where people are contacting the disease. You can see again the the large number of unknown because when we contact trace. We, people have been so many different places now, it's very difficult to say that they got it at the prom or they got it at the store or they got it at uh, down at the Lake of the Ozarks last weekend. Again, uh, we're really um, being hit hard as, as a county, our employees. Uh, prior to 627, we had a total of seven cases. Since 627, we've had 39 cases, uh, including a, a couple uh, new ones today. This is, a, this is a map that uh, it's a little hard to it's a little hard to hard to see it. I, I sent it to you earlier, and, and this is the map that is um, trying to think. Is this the yeah? This is this is the one that the pandemic task force has done, and you can see uh, they're, they're looking at it by zip code. And it gives you an idea of where the growth in cases uh, has been in St. Charles County. 
It's, uh, it's not in the city of St. Charles, where a lot of the problems were early. It's not in Weldon Springs, not in Cottleville. It's basically in northern St. Peter's, northern O'Fallon, uh, into the Wentzville area. Uh, and again, uh, that's where the growth is. But again, uh, it's uh, the growth, uh, they're starting from a much lower number. But it's, it's an area where people maybe weren't as concerned a few weeks ago as they need to be now. And we are continuing to encourage people uh, to wear the mask and are, are handing out masks uh, throughout the county and particularly in these areas. But the interesting thing here is that if you look in St. Louis County, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of those areas in St. Louis County as well. And they have mandated masks. And in some areas, it's been very effective. In others, uh, it hasn't. Uh, and here's a, here's a good example. It's kind of hard to read. Uh, but uh, the darker the, the, the pink or the red, the darker it is, the greater the, uh, uh, the, the, the larger the number of, uh, the larger the percentage of people wearing masks. And you can see in, in St. Louis County, uh, that number is very high, probably 80, 85 percent in West County in the Central Corridor. You can see when you come into St. Charles County and out in Weldon Springs and Cottleville, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very high. In the city of St. Charles, it's, uh, it's, it's as high as it is in any of those uh, St. Louis County uh, precincts. Uh, once again, uh, when you look at some of the areas that have been hit hardest in northern uh, St. Peter's, O'Fallon, those are areas that, uh, that have not, uh, not, not as many people are, um, um, are wearing masks. I think uh, in that one area, it's around 30 percent. But the interesting thing about it, if you go to the right and look at uh, the city of St. Louis, where they have two zip codes, uh, the one downtown, uh, according to the New York Times, which did this survey, 20, only 20 percent of the people in the city of St. Louis are wearing masks. And they're under a mandate uh, to wear the mask. Uh, out further on the periphery in the city, it's about 26 percent. You can see in North County, there's uh, an area, some areas around Ferguson and Florissant, around 30 percent. You can just barely see it, but down in South County, there's also an area that's very low, like s some of our areas in, in, in St. Charles County. Uh, we uh, tried to do some correlation uh, study on um, the number of people wearing masks and what impact that had on the number of cases. And the problem is this particular uh, map is based on census tracts and uh, the other map is based on zip codes. So you can look at it and, and get an appreciation. There are some areas where there's, I think, a real high correlation uh, with non-mask usage and high number of cases, but there's other areas that are just the opposite. You'd think it'd be uh, high cases and it's low cases, or you'd think it'd be low cases and it's high cases. So it um, doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying and working as hard as we can to get people to wear masks, but uh, mandating them in the city of St. Louis, at least, and in parts of uh, St. Louis County has not uh, had the desired result. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, we move, uh, move on now to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Or are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have nothing to remove, but I would like to take the time to publicly thank General Motors, which is in my district, for the kind donation of 100,000 plus masks for the county's residents. I think it was a nice gesture, GM, and I, I appreciate it. I think it does rest the county as well. Okay. Thank you. I need a... Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to join Mr. Cronin thanking him for the mask and then also thank him for not doing away with her third shift. <laughs> okay. one, other, one other thing, just a point for what it's worth to folks out here. I wanted to see the data that you provided, and I appreciate that. But one thing I do want to tell you, I have a 95-year-old mother-in-law who survived the Depression in World War II who came down with COVID this week. She lives in O'Fallon, okay? And she, to our knowledge, has not been exposed to anybody without a mask for close to three months. So I think the CDC says the social distancing is more effective than a mask. So kind of keep that in your mind, too. The mask doesn't protect you from everything. You can still get it with a mask, I believe. Thank you. All right. I'm looking for a motion to uh, approve motion the approved. consent the agenda. Motion okay. Approved. We have second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Consent agenda has passed.
Okay. Uh, first uh, up for bills for final passage is bill number uh, 4864. Bill number 4864, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from A, Agricultural District to RR, Single Family Residential District per application RZ 20-07. Okay, we'll, we'll wait and allow those folks to, to leave. Thank you. Wait. All right. Uh, do I have any? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Brazel has a motion. Amendment to Bill 4864, as on the last whereas, where it says over 30 percent of the owners of the real property within 1,000 feet of the parcel of land for which the revision is being proposed have submitted a written protest, legal remonstrance against the proposed subject rezoning action pursuant to Section 405.535.5B.3 of the Ordinance of St. Charles County, Missouri. Therefore, the super majority vote of five of a total of seven council members is required to pass this bill. Do I have a second? Do second. Have, okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now it's time to uh, discuss the uh, bill. Do I have any comments? Um, starting out with Mr. Brass. I have a couple comments. Um, that was a pretty good slide if Serena showed up there um, on the New Mallee difference between, they keep referring to Winsville versus New Mallee. And, um, and I might have said Winsville, it could be O'Fallon. I don't know exactly where that minor second parcel was. It could have been O'Fallon, but I might have misspoke. But it wasn't the distance between the town. It was the distance it was to already existing uh, four homes per acre. And that it was right pretty much on the line. So that was, that, everything is, has, you gotta look at everything and everything we do here. But this is definitely um, in a rural area, and it's definitely the the, the, the little video that uh, Mr. Griffey sent you is a subdivision that was started in 2004, and uh, it does have problems, but there hasn't been any other subdivisions like that of its kind in that area for over 15 years. And so the folks that had been put in five-acre lake I, lots has been developers who either grew up out there or understand what people want, and they're successfully doing them. I talked to Tom Shaw this weekend. He sent that, that list over that I sent you guys. It showed you that the lots are not more expensive when you buy five acres. It's um, You have a variety to choose from, and in some instances, the five acres are cheaper than the three acres because they don't have all the amenities, and they're able to build their own homes. They don't have to use it as a... The, the builder, whether it be Griffey or Cross Homes or whatever, with a 2,000 or 2,500 square foot minimum. And so it is more rural and you can have an outbuilding and you can have a barn and, and it's just, and that's what people expect, that's what people like. And the only hardship is for this builder is the fact that he won't maximize his profit. It's based on greed where the other folks, or you could say good business sense, whatever you want to call it, but the other folks, uh, Dennis Kaiser, he's got, he's on his third development with five acre life. Tom Shaw's the agent on it. And for the real estate agent in this case, he's calling everybody and he's in, lives in St. Louis County and he's trying to convince, call me and tell me why. Oh, they'll be like one of somebody said how they're trying to do the scare tactics. Oh, they're gonna piece sewers. I don't let them do the sewers. But there aren't, there aren't any sewers because they dump the sewage in New Melly dumps into the lake at New Melly Lakes in the, the park we now own, which I don't know if you guys know that, but, and they used to have a lot of problems with it. So we're not gonna put any more capacity in that sewage treatment plant dumping into the lake into our, park and that's a fact and so they don't have real sewers out there it's it's a sewage treatment plant and so that's not even an option so the five acres is is what is needs to be that's what they've been doing out there that's what people expect that's what every the, the people have been buying five acre lots so why you know it's not fair to switch now or even the developers have been doing five acres with no complaints no complaints at all and so um it, it it's beyond me that um, I don't know I mean it's it, it just doesn't make any sense to switch it now when it's been successfully working so um, I would really appreciate the council support on this and it's very important to people who live in that area they want the rural characteristics of the area they want the heritage the culture the history and it's all about the, the development of a county isn't about shoving a bunch of houses in, in areas that because people want to live in subdivisions. It's about having different parts. Of, it's about having city. It's having suburbia. It's having rural areas. It's about having a, a hodgepodge of different variety for the uniqueness of the county. And that's what makes a county 
very favorable. And that's why people, a lot of people who live, move from St. Louis County, as me, 25, almost 30 years ago, move from St. Louis County out here because of what we have out here. And so, so often people will move from St. Louis County and say, well, maybe we need to start putting up street lights and doing this and, and bring St. Louis County with them or wherever they're from and change it when they moved here because of the way it is. It doesn't make any sense. And so I would appreciate your support on keeping it to five acre minimum and, and, um, and that's what I'm asking the council for today. Mr. Crumb. Mr. Crumb. At the last meeting, um, the, Mr. Griffey's attorney made some some statements about whether this their their application was consistent with the master plan and five acre lots were not master were not consistent. I did a little research and asked the county staff to help on this as well, and and they pulled pull this sentence out. I think it's pretty meaningful. It's the intent of this plan to promote continued farming and agricultural use in these areas until rural residential development occurs. And then it says under rural residential development, it said primary use single family residence on large lots, generally three plus acres, raising of horses permitted, et cetera. So the, the argument that somehow us have to, it has to be approved because of the master plan, that's kind of moot according to the master plan if you read it closely. Uh, another thing um, I, I would like Mr. Griffey to take a look at, uh, we had a similar situation to yours come before the council in my district a few months back. And the gentleman was asking for three acre lots out in near Forestdale. And I explained to him a new uh, ordinance change that myself and Mr. Brazel worked on to basically, re basically reduce the requirements for five acre lots. That gentleman owned almost 200 acres. He had applications in for three acre lots. After he did the math for the changes in the development cost, he came back and refiled for five acre lots. I would strongly encourage you to talk to Mike Hurlbert and county staff about the reduction in, in development costs related to five acre lots because we do value as a builder and we do value the jobs that you create in this county. But we think maybe that might be a better way. And for that reason, I don't support this as well. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd just like to, to point out, you know, again, uh, that we always have this pull and tug with the master plan. And, and, I, and I, you know, over the years I, I've seen us, and, and we've all done it, including myself, you know, the master plan is uh, something that is uh, kind of uh, set in stone if we are for a project that falls under the master plan. If it is a project that doesn't fall under the master plan, then we remind everyone that the master plan is just a suggestion, okay? And that's, you know, that's just human nature, and that's how we've, I think all of us on this council have kind of been there, all right, depending on, you know, our own feelings on each individual project. And I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, as we ap approach these projects, they are done on an individual basis. You know, we, we have not drawn a line and made an ordinance that said that if you're on this side of the line, it's gotta be a five acre lot, or this side of the line, it's gotta be a three acre lot. Uh, we take each one of these individually. And I think what we what we sometimes do is we, we sometimes use the master plan to, you know, to, you know uh, kind of placate, uh, you know, our own, our, own particular uh, opinions. And again, having been on the, the planning and zoning during the presentation, um, you know, the, the planning and zoning was, was basically looking at what the, uh, the master plan said and, of course, what our staff here, uh, our county staff, was also recommending. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I just re want to remind the council that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval for this development. And, uh, they usually take a, a long time listening to all the people talk about it. I don't know if there wasn't a large uh, amount of people at the Planning and Zoning Com Commission that's here today, but uh, they did recommend approval. Okay. All right, any other comments? Okay. Just make a comment yes. on the plan and zoning. Sure. A lot of the folks out here, when that was going on, it was the COVID thing was more intense. And a lot of those folks said that they could not come to the meeting, and a lot of them are elderly as well. So a lot of folks, there would be a lot more folks here today, but for that reason, and, th and that's what I was told. So, yeah. you know, being on the planning and zoning, we did receive a large number of correspondence from those folks, but uh, at the meeting itself, there was, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, sparse attendance. And again, most of these folks are older, and I think that's what they said in their letters. Okay. Donna, I think you can call the vote. Amended Bill Number 4864, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri, by rezoning land from A, Agricultural District, to RR, Single Family Residential District, per application RZ 20-07. Councilmember Cronin? No. Councilmember Brazel? No. Councilmember Elam? Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? No. Councilmember White? No. Right. The, uh, Bill number 4864 fails. Uh, we now move on to bill number 4865. Bill number 4865, an ordinance establishing the Forest Wood Lane Road Neighborhood Improvement District and ordering the preparation of plans and specifications. Questions or comments on bill number 4865? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance establishing the Forest Wood Lane Road Neighborhood Improvement District and ordering the preparation of plans and specifications. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Okay. Bill number 4865 passes. Uh, next bill for final passage is bill number 4866. Bill number 4866, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute form agreements with school districts in St. Charles County to provide for continued placement of school resource officers at schools in those districts. Questions or comments? Well, I'm glad yep. to see that this is not a county that's going to kick the resource op officers out of the schools because I think they perform a very uh, needed and and um, proper function. So I, I was going to say I agree with Nancy. I think it's it's very important that they're in the schools and they um, develop relationships and rapport. It's very important. So thank you yeah, for get getting this going. You know, again, after, you know, having spent 34 years in schools, I, I, I can't, um, other than the, the principal, assistant principal, and a couple other people, the resource officer literally has his pulse, finger on the pulse of what's going on in the school as much or more so than anyone. And, and these people are just incredibly valuable. Uh, you know, first of all, for law enforcement also, but also to, to uh, stop problems before they get rolling. So, okay, Donna, please call the roll. Bill number 4866, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute form agreements with school districts in St. Charles County to provide for continued placement of school resource officers at schools in those districts. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Okay. Bill number 4866 passes. Um, last bill for final passage is bill number 4867. Bill number 4867, an ordinance authorizing execution of documents for receipt of grant funds in the amount of $58,008 from the Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and further amending Ordinance 19-108 by providing related supplemental appropriations to the general fund budget of the Police Department for Coronavirus Emergency Response. Questions, comments? Seeing none, please call the roll. An ordinance authorizing execution of documents for receipt of grant funds in the amount of $58,008 from the Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and further amending Ordinance 19-108 by providing related supplemental appropriations to the general fund budget of the Police Department for Coronavirus Emergency Response. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Schneider? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Councilmember Elam? Councilmember Hammond. Yes. <laughs> you just went on by. What? He didn't answer. He did? yeah, yeah, no, he didn't. Yeah. They overlooked you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> All right, bill number 40, uh, 4867 uh, passes. Uh, next up is bills for introduction, starting with bill number 4868. And I beg to uh, interrupt, oh, sure. Mr. Brazel. Yes. What was your vote? Yes. Was it yes? yes. Okay. Bill number 4868, requested by Craig Tukowski, sponsored by Nancy Schneider, an ordinance authorizing execution of Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission's Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES Act, agreement, project number 20-116A1, to provide CARES Act financial assistance <laughs> under the state block grant program and to maintain safe and efficient airport operations, including the airport's operational and maintenance expenses, or debt service payment and other expenses directly related to the airport incurred no later, no earlier than January 20th, 
2020 and to accept a grant not to exceed $69,000, which represents 100% of funding available for qualifying expenses and amending Ordinance 19-108 for supplemental appropriations to the budget of the Coronavirus Relief Fund for Airport Improvements. Questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, may I just yes. comment that um, I think the council is familiar with Title V of the CARES Act, which is the bill that you all did for us uh, appropriating in it to various categories. But the CARES Act is actually uh, about 2,800 pages long and has multiple titles in it. So some of these things that you're seeing come in from CARES Act, for instance, in this case, are coming down from the state as an allocation that they got for a particular transportation or other purpose. So you'll continue to see these as the state is making grants. For instance, last week, the state announced $22 million in grants for not-for-profits. That's from part of the uh, billion plus that they received under the CARES Act. So. Any other questions? All right. Moving on, we go to bill number 4869 for introduction. Bill number 4869 requested by Chief Kurt Frizz, sponsored by Terry Hollander, an ordinance authorizing execution of the revised St. Charles County Regional SWAT team agreement with municipalities who are signatories thereto. Questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we move on to bill number 4870. Bill number 4870 requested by Chief Kurt Frizz, sponsored by council as a whole, an ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute documents from the Missouri State Emergency Management Agency, SEMA, for receipt of funds from the fiscal year 2020 Emergency Management Performance Grant. Questions or comments on bill number 4870? Okay, seeing none, that uh, closes the bills for introduction. Uh, there are no tabled bills. Um, we close with any kind of announcements and miscellaneous. Okay, need a motion to adjourn. Okay. So moved. Okay. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your patience.